All right. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenter, Megan. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I would like to go ahead and, oh, I'm hearing that the screen is dark. I think it's just your first slide. Once you, once you go to the next one, it was a lighter color. Okay, fantastic. All right, so I'll go ahead and keep it on this dark slide just for beginnings here. But good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Covey, and I thank you for carving time out of your busy schedules to share in this space with me today in learning about AAC practitioner practices that make champion communicators. So let's go ahead and jump in together. Um, a little bit about me. So I'm an employee of Westside Children's Therapy and Midwestern University, where really my heart is uh, helping complex communicators navigate and communicate in this world and to provide um, perspective to peers about all the ways people can effectively and efficiently communicate their wants and needs across settings. Um, I do this by collaborating with a variety of companies to pair individual client needs with technology that'll help scaffold their communication. So without further ado, let's jump in together to learn what is the practitioner practice that makes champion communicators. So the AAC practice that makes champion communicators is modeling the relationship with the client's AAC device to all communication partners. So you might've noticed the title of this slide as AAC Embrace. And these words were specifically chosen because the word embrace um, embodies this idea of, of holding something closely in your arms as a sign of, of affection. And when we layer on and talk about the relationship with AAC, we're really talking about the, the way you connect with the device. We're talking about the way two or more people or things are connected and behave toward one another. So when we think about you know, the perfect relationship between AAC clients and the team, we just want it to be healthy. And that word healthy by no means means, means perfect, but it means the relationship is built on a strong foundation that can last throughout the child's life or however long they need augmentative communication to support their needs. In therapies, we can teach this relationship, um, this healthy relationship by modeling, you know, the healthiest relationship we can with AAC. And to model this healthy relationship, we will do a variety of different things so that we're supporting clients in their journey toward more independent communication. So I'm gonna give some examples of what you as the communication partner can say to build healthy relationships around these topics. So to build healthy relationships, we, we want mutual respect. And mutual respect means that each person in relation to AAC values who the other is and, and values what the other person's boundaries are. So you learn this through observation of your client using the AAC device. Where does the child position his or her AAC device? Do they push their hand away when you try to model? We as the clinicians um, have to learn our clients' boundaries and thank them for learning with us and being open to, to that to that space that they're sharing. And when we do that, we're developing that mutual respect with our clients. Um, to build trust, we can do this by giving our clients the benefit of the doubt when it comes to communication. So phrases um, that I like to use and maybe that you use in your own clinical practice are, uh, you know, maybe you meant dot, 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 and model that response. When we do that, we're building trust that what they were trying to say or attempting to say is valid and important, and we're here for that. When we're trying to build honesty here for that healthy relationship building, we can do this by saying, you know what? I didn't understand what you meant there, but I'm here in this space and I'm trying to understand and I'm here with you. Can you show me a different way to express that and accept whatever form of communication that is. And that's modeling this healthy relationship space as they're learning AAC side by side with you. 
We also want to build a healthy relationship with compromise. Compromise here is each communication partner doesn't always <laughs> get their way um, in, in every clinical session. So your client and you should be able to acknowledge your different points of view about a topic. So you know what? Hey, I hear that you are wanting the swing. Let's go um, in the OT gym and see if it's available. It's avail if it's available, my answer is yes, absolutely. Otherwise, we will have to wait. And when we do that, we're showing compromise. You as the SLP might know, hey, there is a, the swing is not available, but by taking the client there, by showing them that experience, by having them see that, hey, it's not available and that you're willing to compromise, you're showing that this is healthy and that you're listening and that you want to be able to offer them these opportunities that are motivating to them. When we talk about healthy individuality, clients shouldn't have to compromise who they are and their identity is not based on their communication partner. So your client should continue to be able to love the things that they love to do and support um, and support that. If your client is starting to expand outside of the things that they love, the communication to the partner should be supported of the clients wanting to pursue new hobbies or, or make new friends or whatever they're trying to express. That's the space where growth happens. Um, and that's because you're building this healthy space to communicate. And of course, good communication is healthy. Clients who are able to speak honestly and openly to avoid miscommunication is is best practice. If the client needs to sort out his or her feelings, we can always take a step back and respect those wishes until the space, um, until the client's in a space where they can communicate all of that. This can require you to pivot from, you know, your therapy plan in the day, but this is often where the AAC magic happens. It happens here. Um, I also want to address anger control and healthy relationships. So we all get angry. <laughs> so how can we help our clients um, express it in the best ways that we can? So how we express it affects our relationships with everyone. And it can be handled in healthy ways, taking a deep breath, counting to 10, talking it out. And when we talk it out with AAC on an AAC device, we're acknowledging the anger. Hey, I see you're mad because this happened. What can we do now? And this directly leads to problem solving with your client. So problem solving here um, can be taking um, small, uh, learning to solve problems by taking small little parts and talking through the different situations and solutions to that problem. So maybe they need to be able to ask for a break or change their environment. And we as the SLPs or communication partners are there for all of that um, to be able to problem solve when problems arise in communication, which happens all of the time. Um, I wanna address fighting fair here too. So everyone argues at some point, but those who are can be fair and stick to the subject are more likely to come up with a possible, a possible solution. So how this can look in therapy is, hey, I know needing to ask for help, um, you know, makes you really mad. Um, but right now the situation is not safe and I'm gonna help you be safe and then give you space. By doing that again, you're building this healthy relationship with AAC by modeling it, by listening and by showing. Um, so when we talk about understanding here, each communication, um, when we talk about understanding here, each communication partner should take the time to understand what the other might be feeling and self-confidence. When your client has confidence in themselves, it can help their relationship with their AAC device and their relationship with others. They'll eventually be able to show that they're calm and comfortable enough to allow others to see their emotions and to express their emotions. And we can also build a healthy relationship with AAC by being a role model. So we can embody what respect and all the above, above bullet points mean to families, to teams. And by doing this, we're showing that we're learning. Um, this is a really great acronym, um, this acronym LEARN, because it helps us remember to listen, engage, acknowledge, rapport build, and nurture. And we can all start learning to build healthy relationships with AAC. Today, 
by doing a variety of different things systematically. So we can start by naming the device, talking about voicing and skin tone options, um, talking about vocabulary additions, um, talking about the client's current language level, talking about you know, social emotional states, and then establishing teaching trajectory. For today, today's teachings assume that the child coming to therapy um, with a speech generating device is gonna be appropriately featured matched and the family is seeking your services for implementation. So now let's go ahead and jump in to building um, healthy relationships with AAC devices. Um, before I go into naming the device, I see that there's some chatter about not being able to see slides or content. Um, if you're experiencing that, I apologize, and I hope that um, you're able to connect with us soon. Um, right now, we're talking about naming the device. When we talk about naming the device, um, I am going to read this exact definition because I think it resonates with what we're going to talk about next here. When we talk about naming the device, it means that we're going to um, let me scroll over here. Um, naming thing is part of just general human connection using words and language. It's an aspect of everyday taxonomy as people distinguish the objects of their experience together with their similarities and differences, which observers, you know, identify, um, name and classify. So that's a big fancy way of saying, you know, the act of naming <laughs> cements psychological ownership, the feeling that something is yours. So we often, we often name objects like cars, instruments, boats, cameras, all items that we develop special relationships with and consider extensions of our own identities. It indicates um, affection and it triggers further bonding with that object. So we want to name the AAC device. So some name options that you can consider can be talker, words, voice, device, computer, Bob, Paul, you know, whatever you are uh, wanting to call the AAC device, you just want to decide on it together. <clears throat> this name will stick. So we want to first make sure that the family likes it. This is going to travel with the child as long as they need it. And we want this to carry over across settings. So my talker is my talker in ABA, my talker is my talker in speech, my talker is my talker in OT, my talker is my talker at home, my talker is my talker at school. This talker is mine to express myself. This talker is mine to express myself. This also has direct implications for when you're talking um, about cross-disciplinary co collaboration, it's great to be able to say like, hey, grab your talker. And the OT says, grab your talker. And the BCBA says, grab your talker. And the speech therapist says, your talker. How cool for that child to hear like, yeah, it's my talker. Got it. Got it across all these settings. So now that we've talked about naming the device for use across, across settings, let's talk about what the voice sounds like and what the, what the symbols can look like to build that healthy relationship. Here. So when we talk about voicing here, um, your, your own voice serves as a guide for, uh, for what you say and how you say it. So your voice can not only affect how people perceive you, but also their willingness to listen to you. So for our clients that are non-speaking or limited speaking or, um, you know, communication is, is harder than it is for other people, we want them to be heard. So for the families and the team, um, you may consider having a conversation about the volume of the device or where the communication partner sits, where you are talking so that the client is heard and feels heard. Some clients um, seem to like when you sit next to them, some like when you sit across from them, um, but actually speaking about the physical space where, where communication happens can be, can be really important to help the client build a healthy relationship with their voice. And it goes leaps and bounds when you bring all of these things up about, about the voice to the family because they may have never considered how important the AAC uh, device voice is. And being able to document where this, what the name of the voice is, is it Ella, is it Josh? Um, you know, and ha documenting that so that if it gets changed for whatever reason, it's back to what their voice should be. Um, so showing families um, the options for voicing and the importance of making that decision, again, leads to healthy relationship building. Um, maybe 
the family wants a voice that will make people laugh or reflect what the child's vocalizations sound like or what they want their child's voice to sound like or something totally different. But by having that conversation, you are, you're embracing AAC and you're embracing all of the components that make good AAC, good AAC. So then let's talk about what the symbols look like um, and skin tone. So representation matters. Representation matters. So some clients can be more interested and engaged when they see themselves reflected in books and toys and media. And that's the same for their AAC device. It can be really, really inspiring um, to see someone that looks like you on something that everyone around you sees as a positive, healthy, motivating thing. Um, and it can help develop empathy and all these positive emotions um, in this place where communication is happening. So show families um, the options for skin tones on symbol supported softwares. Um, families might say, hey, I want the, the symbols to look like my family. Or, hey, they might want diverse symbols to model diversity and acceptance. But again, by having these conversations, you're building healthy connection to the family, to the client, and to the device. And so the next conversation to consider having is, is vocabulary additions. So when we talk about vocabulary additions, we're talking about what words you are teaching. What words you are teaching. We are building healthy vocabulary by using personally relevant connections in an operational framework. And you can do the, um, this operational framework that's adapted by Solberg and Matir. It's simple, it's quick, and it's really, really effective. So we look at what the client can do, needs to do, and wants to do to make clinical, te uh, clinical decisions about vocabulary teaching. So if you look over to the side here, uh, you're gonna see the word swing. And then over to the left, you're gonna see the communication partners, parent, OT, and BCBA. So as we look at this example, and we talk to the parent and we say, okay, what can your, what can your child do with the swing? Okay, they can look, they can point, and they can run to the swing. What do they need to do? They need to be able to ask for the swing, wait to walk to the swing, and what does, the client want to do, swing. If you have the same conversation with the OT, you would say, okay, what can the client do? And they'll say, hey, they can look, point, and they can run to the swing. What do they need to do? They need to ask for different types of swings. And what does the client want to do? Swing. And then if we look at the uh, BCBA, you would say, hey, what, does, what can the client do right now? They can look, point, and run to the swing. And what does the client need to be able to do? Ask for the swing, travel with their talker, and what does the client want to do swing? So across all of these pro professionals, communication partners, we have agreement that the client wants to swing and the client needs to ask for the swing. Then the team members have different skills they want to embed to make the client's swing experience that much healthier, that much better, that much more motivating. So how can we as the speech pathologists, communication partners, pick and teach vocabulary that will make the child's swinging experience that much better across disciplines, across environments, across everywhere, so that they can do their favorite things all of the time. So here's some examples here of what you could consider. So I, you would probably agree that you would start teaching swing across all communication partners. It's the one area that everyone agreed upon. Then we can vary a little bit here. So maybe you're thinking of uh, opening up some other vocabulary words or systematically teaching specific words that relate to what the parent, the OT and the BCBA um, are wanting to develop on behalf of that client to help them grow with their favorite things. So maybe for the parent, you're going to open up the word walk or specifically teach the word walk and go for modeling safety. Maybe for the OT, you're going to add the word or teach the word blue and rainbow to distinguish between two different swings so that there's choices. As um, for the BCBA, you might open up the words go, walk, stop, get to help them acquire their um, talker speech generating device to access the swing. And as the SLP, you can look at the words the team is needing and separate these into core and fringe buckets so we can still maintain a balanced set 
a vocabulary for language building and then expand and suggest other words that could could fill gaps or um, add to the joy of communicating. So if you notice to the right side here, um, you may add the word like pogo or big because maybe you want to open up the pogo sticks. Uh, maybe you want the client to access the pogo sticks pogo stick swing or be able to give them a big push or big swing. Um, but by doing this, you're still expanding vocabulary. You're still um, building that language with all of these professionals. This list is in no way exhaustive, but my hope was that um, it can model how we work together to build a language system around the client first. And so when we, um, the hope is that the child can indicate the want and need for different types of swings or settings, which makes everyone's life better because you're showing that we're listening. And so after you've started therapy with the client's personally relevant vocabulary, they've acquired some language targets through mastery and exposure, we as the SLPs and communication partners, we want to continue to pinpoint and plan their language trajectory, which can be hard. How can you do that when we have a whole language to learn? So we wanna look at the client's language level and we wanna look at it right now. So we wanna be able to describe where the client is right now across language areas for long-term goal planning, again, to set up this language trajectory. I've linked some resources that I like below. And the first one that I'm gonna talk about is the, the Dynamic Goals AAC Assessment Grid. Now this resource that I've linked below is very comprehensive and it's going to systematically describe what emergent looks like, what emergent transitional looks like, what context dependent looks like, what um, transition independent looks like, and what independent looks like for, for communicators. If there's time at the end, I'll pull up this resource, but I want you to have this here. Because when you can pinpoint where your client's language level is at currently and where we want it to be with the family, this is where language planning grows and happens quickly and efficiently when done with the ease and um, care that I'll go into and talk about next. So as you're talking about the client's current language communication level with the family, often difficult conversations happen right here. And these difficult questions often stem from coming to the AAC table with a range of emotions. So while some families are feeling you know, hopeful and excited and motivated, we also need to acknowledge that AAC can be met with, can be met with grief. And there's a space for grief in, in talking about AAC. The reality is um, not all of our clients will become speaking. And there's a whole host of emotions that families can feel. So when we talk about AAC, with families, it's important to keep in mind where the family is right now and get context for what the family could already be carrying regarding their child's voice. And as I said, one of those feelings can be grief. Um, so the five stages of grief I'll reference today are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And I'm gonna provide some um, examples of what these may sound like in conversations with families, but please in no way assume the family's thoughts or you know, their own space in, in potentially grieving. But by, able, by being able to analyze what the families say, it can give you insight as how to listen better as a clinician, how to ask questions better and how to help their child grow in this, in this space. So, when we talk about denial here, um, something that this can sound like is they just don't want to talk. They just need more time. Anger here can sound like, I can't believe I have to learn all this. I have to take this everywhere. If they would have gotten he better help, we wouldn't be here. Bargaining. If I had only spent more time with them, they would be talking. Um, if we had only gotten services started younger, they would be talking. Um, depression. I don't know how to go on from here. Why keep going with this? And there's acceptance. Um, I can find a new path from here for my family, and I'm happy my child can communicate. So I just wanted to, to put this in this presentation today because there is space to have healthy conversations um, about AAC, no matter where the family, the child, and the team are with building a relationship with AAC.
once the relationships are healthy and established across communication partners, how can we keep, keep moving the client forward for their language trajectory? Um, I included a nice uh, a visual on this slide that just says there's power in space, um, in a breath, in a pause before you respond. You get to choose hate or love, anger or em empathy, frustration or opportunity, lonely or together, irritation or understanding, be kind, pause. So in those moments when there might be anger, there might be sadness, there might be depression, um, pause. Um, because often taking that time will help you as the clinician um, to, to plan that and be in that space with that family at that time. So now we have to keep their language trajectory moving forward here. And so how do we keep the client moving forward through the emotions now that they've got some personally relevant vocabulary under their belt, what do we do as the clinician? Let's say they've acquired about 50, 50 words of things that they really love. What do we do now? What do we do as their SLPs? How can we teach a whole language system in 45, 90 minutes, 180 minutes um, a week? And we have to set up a realistic teaching trajectory. And so to set up a a, a teaching trajectory, we have to reference typical development for teaching. So let's say we're working with a client who's three years or about 36 months. We want to look at AAC in the context of pragmatics, semantics, syntax, phonology, um, literacy socialization, phonological awareness, um, print awareness, reading, writing. And when we do that, it'll help to provide the language that's coming next. So on this slide is examples of what a three-year-old should be doing across areas here. So it is small, and I know that, so I apologize for it, but I want it to be comprehensive here. So when we talk about pragmatics here, by age three, topic continuation nears 50%. Topics are recontinued, you add new information, language and in play increases, narratives are sequences with theme but no plot, um, semantics, use and understanding of why questions, understanding and use of spatial terms in, on, under, etc. Syntax, they should be at brown stage three, modulation of simple sentences, present tense auxiliaries appear, be verbs used inconsistently, overgeneralized past tense forms appear. Phonology, speech is 75% intelligible, their ability to produce rhymes emerge. Literacy socialization, um, learns to be able to turn the pages to get to the next part of the story, learns to read from left to right progression, um, learns that print is stable, um, phonological awareness, being able to segment sentences into words, um, blend, segment, um, print awareness, learns their alphabet song, um, learns to recognize and name the different letters, reading, learns to recognize name and print, um, be able to read a McDonald's sign, and writing, begins representational drawing, learns to write their name, distinguish drawing from writing. So there are so many skills across areas that a three-year-old um, with AAC can be doing. Oh, I think my slides are different here. I apologize, guys. Megan, it looks like we're in um, presenter mode and it looks like it's muted you again. Oh my gosh. Well, I apologize for everyone. Go ahead and talk amongst yourselves for just a moment here. All right, hopefully everyone can see that now. I can see it and hear you. Okay, fantastic. I apologize for that little snafu here. Um, but as we're referencing typical um, teaching and knowing that that child has 50 words, let's use that word swing as an example here. So if we're using that word swing and we're thinking about pragmatic development, um, semantic development, syntactical development, what can we do even with that word swing? So with pragmatics, we could say my turn to swing, your turn to swing. Let's keep talking about the swing and keep talking about that topic. As we talk about 
semantics. Um, because a three-year-old is already being able to use and understand why questions, we want to be able to um, teach and show that our client is able to use who, what, and where. Hey, where's the swing? Is the swing available? Who's in the swing? Who's going to swing with me today? Um, why are we going swinging? Um, syntax here, you're going to be thinking about all of those brown morphemes. So, hey, let's go swinging. Yesterday, we went swinging. Um, tomorrow, when we're in therapy, we will swing together. And this is what really separates speech pathologists from BCBA, from OT, is we have this deep understanding of all of these different language components. So, Again, as we're talking about this word swing, what's all the things that we can do with swing? And talk about phonology here, you know, verbal speech is still the gold standard. So if swinging is their favorite thing, hey, let's try and get the word swing. Um, and let's talk about the words that rhyme with swing. Swing, ring, um, let's um, draw our attention to the letters in swing. So hey, swing starts with the letter S, point out the letter S on their AAC device. Swing is spelled S-W-I-N-G. Hey, what are some words that also start with the letter S? We've got snacks. Snacks are delicious and you love snacks. And this is how we can also relate all of the words that they already have in different ways to build and expand language. Um, when we think about um, reading, hopefully they can read that word swing, but we can work on segmenting it out on the child's communication platform. So swing is s, w, e, n, n. All of those sounds together make the word swing. And then we can separate that word out, use symbols that are on their AAC device and get really creative in the ways that we're teaching their favorite things. And then we can also practice writing the word swing. We can practice typing the word swing um, because it is important. And even if you don't have a deep understanding of all of the nuances of how to navigate the software and the hardware, the best way to learn AAC is by doing AAC. So there's power in sitting next to the client and learning it alongside them. Um, because if they see you doing that, that's going to just empower and show the healthy relationship that you're trying to build with them to be able to um, have them ask for the wants and needs that they're that they're trying to attain. So modeling a healthy relationship with the client's AAC device to all communication partners is everything, is everything. Um, if we can set up this relationship up for success, by naming the device, by collaborating on voicing and skin tone, by discussing vocabulary addition, by identifying a client's language level, by you know, identifying the social emotional state and having these conversations with family, by validating AAC and by establishing this teaching traje trajectory, your child or your client will achieve their communication goals across, across settings. And all of these things you can do in therapy starting today and you don't have to know everything about AAC to model this positive space that AAC has in your life and for and for your client's life. So I am going to backtrack a little bit here and be able to show some of the resources that I've discussed. And I think some of the best, you know, teaching and presentations that happen are when there is um, audience participation. So I do want to back up here to the slide that talks about um, the dynamic goals assessment grid and speak about um, some other examples here when we when we talk about clients favorite things. So I am going to stop sharing for just a moment here. I'm going to share a little bit more information and then about 115 I'll open up the floor to questions specific about anything that I've shared today or anything specific to your clients here. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing just for a moment here. Open up the dynamic assessment goals grid so that you all get to see it in real time. And I'm gonna th scroll through what this can look like. Hey, Megan. Sorry, I muted you again. 
Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, fantastic. So as we uh, look at this resource and check out this ability level continuum, we've got a variety of different language stages here that breaks these down into different areas of emergent, emergent transitional, context dependent, transitional independent, and then independent here. So it gives some really fantastic check boxes that you as the clinician can quickly and easily um, you know, mark off transfer all of that information down here. Then as you keep scrolling here, it's gonna go over all of these competency areas and help generate some goals for you as the clinician um, for what an emergent level um, linguistic competency goal can look like. Um, what a um, op emergent transitional operational competency goal can look like social competency. And this resource can be um, a really simple, easy way for parents and families to understand where their child is on the language teaching trajectory and where they want their child to be and setting up those expectations for where therapy is going um, right from the start. So here's some long-term goals. I mean, it is a really fantastic resource that I hope you all um, are able to access at the end of this presentation. At the very end in, uh, in this resource is an ability level progress support. Now, even though a client might not get to full independence by the time we've um, finished therapy with them, we may be able to get them through 100% of the emergent communicator skills or 100% of the emergent transitional skills. And what a huge um, impact that can have for our clients. And even though teaching and learning AAC is hard, um, this is something that is attainable, that is systematic, and that we can use um, for any any client who's using AAC. Okay. I'm also going to open up the assessment of learning processes for AAC. This one is a rubric. It's gonna take me a moment here and I'm hoping that I will not um, lose you all when I uh, stop sharing for a moment. Thank you for alerting me if I do. It has muted you again. Thank you very much. Okay, so this handout is now, should be loaded. And this separates, is a beautiful rubric that separates language into different stages. So often language tracking for all of the components of language is really tricky, especially when you're trying to teach syntax, grammar, morphology, print awareness, all of it do good therapy, yet take good data collection. And sometimes a rubric is the answer to that question. And this one is fantastic for walking through the different language stages of stage one, stage two, and stage three. If you keep scrolling here, it's gonna give even more specific information about each stage. And then at the very end, there is um, a beautiful resource that has all of the stages all together so that in a therapy session, you could circle where the client is and then show growth for when they move to that next stage. Where that next stage of growth happens is where the family should be um, alerted here of this change in programming and how their client is going to So as I said, these are resources that I like, that I have found extremely useful in clinical practice that are helpful in combining this operational framework with what the client needs to be able to communicate, what the client wants to, to be able to communicate, and pairing this with the whole team in thinking about all of this in context with what their peers are doing across environments. So as I said, the practitioner practice that makes champion communicators is modeling a healthy relationship with the client's AAC device 
to all communication partners. And you can do this starting today in therapy. Thank you guys so much for taking the time and the space to share in this uh, conversation about how to be um, an inclusive um, AAC practitioner and how you can have these, um, these conversations in meaningful and supportive ways. Um, I'd like to take this time now to um, answer any questions, um, listen to comments, listen to concerns. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to get some stuff live. I'll remain on for the next 15 minutes if anyone's feeling brave. Are you able to pull up the Q&A window? There are two questions in there currently. Oh, fantastic. I see two that are open. One is from Jennifer. So Jennifer said, I work in the senior wing of the County Board DD School and in the adult centers. How do we get buy-in from caregivers and community homes? You should tend to usage tends to disappear when the client graduates. Um, so Jennifer, could you give me a little bit more information here? Um, how do we get buy-in from caregivers in community homes? So often, Jennifer, this buy-in is gonna start with you and your, your team. And then to be able to expand that outwardly is to be able to model the positive relationships that you're having here. Um, with the power of, of media, if you have media releases, being able to show all the good things that are happening within your school and adult centers, um, when fantastic things are happening in your setting and doing that across other settings, often um, professionals will, or families will say, yeah, you know what, let's do that. Let's do that um, to help bridge that gap. Does that answer your question, Jennifer? If you're still on? Okay. Um, Teresa said, I had a Caucasian teen boy who selected black male voices and dark skin representation. We did discuss, but I was very uncomfortable. Anyone's thoughts? Thank you for bringing that to the table. Um, I don't know if you're com uh, comfortable sharing in this large group setting why you felt uncomfortable. Um, but um, I would be curious in asking um, the, the teen boy why they selected black male voices and darker skin representation. I think there's power in throwing that back on the client and the family to help solve some of that so that if there is uncomfort, you can discuss that in a way that um, in a way that's productive and say, hey, you know what? You're your son selected a black male voice and dark skin representation. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, this is kind of a family decision. You guys own the AAC device. Uh, I'd love to make sure that everyone's on board with this. Um, I, and talk about all the things that you like about that. Maybe his whole friend group um, is black male and has dark skin representation. Maybe he wants to fit in. Um, but again, I don't have all those answers, but that's some ways that you can talk about it. What are some resources to teach parents and caregivers the language of AAC? Um, I do have some resources, Stacy, that I would be happy to share with you here. Um, it might be easier if I put my email address in the chat so that you can reach out to me separately um, for those. Um, any tips for AAC therapy via teletherapy? Yes, um, I'm an open book um, when it comes to therapy resource sharing, um, and I would be happy um, to give you some of my teletherapy um, resources um, and connections to help bridge that gap. It's still going to be very personally relevant um, therapy that you're doing. So let's say your client loves Mario Kart. You on the um, practitioner end of things are going to have to have many tools in your toolbox to keep Mario Kart fresh, <laughs> to keep it to keep it very fresh. So um, I will uh, put my email address in the the uh, chat or Jim, if you can do that, that would be fantastic. Um, and please reach out to me, um, and I will link all of that. Um, I do a variety of different types of sessions for different clients in different linguistic trajectory buckets. Um, so. Some of those sessions are thematic units, um, and I will happily share my themed units with you. Is there research that supports team building for AAC? Yes, there are, and I would be happy to provide those to you, Karen. Um, 
there are you again karen if you could reach out to me via email that would be fantastic if you're looking for articles um i would be happy to give you articles if you're looking for like quick reference sheets i would be happy to do quick reference sheets if you're looking for more of an in-service type thing um i would be happy to provide you in-service type um, scenarios. If you're looking for communication partner training that's evidence-based, I can also give you those resources. Okay, lots of questions. This is fantastic, guys. Thank you. Um, how can we access those form? Oh, how can we access those forms for different stages? Um, that I will link it if I haven't already in the Q and A. I'm doing EI remotely. I have several littles who could use an AAC device. How can I model a device if I'm in a different state? Um, fantastic question. So technology companies are fantastic resources. So if you are doing EI remotely and you're wanting to model that through the screen without having an AAC device present for that client, there are so many different um, things that you can download uh, to be able to model that. One of those is called New Voice, which is through PRC Saltillo. So again, if you shoot me an email um, specifically with your name, Lori, I can give you that resource and then talk about the interfacing when you're doing teletherapy AAC. Uh, Bridget, do you have any tips on how to discuss AAC use with intervention specialists and staff that refuse to support carryover into the classroom. When I, the SLP, am unable to be in the room promoting communication across the school setting during the day. Um, Bridget, that's a fantastic question. So um, as we've talked about um, just the healthy relationship with AAC, you've got to build that healthy relationship with the intervention specialists um, and staff. So to do that, you might really have to take some baby steps and figure out where if there's unhealthiness in that initial relationship building, once you can kind of target why that device is not, why there's refusal to support carryover in the classroom, that'll help answer some of the questions about, um, you know, how it can be used. What can we do to fix that? Um, but until you know why that refusal is happening, um, you're going to, you're going to have an uphill battle. <laughs> Thanks for your thoughts, Cheryl. I appreciate it. Um, are there specific types of AAC devices you prefer over others? No, I do not. Um, the reason I say that is because um, I'm an AAC evaluator. When I am looking at, when I am doing AAC evaluations, we're feature matching what the client um, can do to what they need to do. And often um, different softwares are organized in different ways to cater to different types of clients. So my brain does not work the same way that my husband's brain works. We would need two different softwares to be able to get our messages across. And there's beauty in the fact that our brains work differently to um, make language and do do the world together. So um, I can't say that I prefer one over the other. There's one that my brain typically tends to like more because it matches more my language style. But no, I do not have a I do not have a favorite. My favorite is the one that my client can use. <laughs> um, thanks for saying it was great. Thanks for saying your email. Okay, I'm wondering about AAC AT via teletherapy, specifically providing AAC models without access to a loan device. Yes, I can um, help you get access to new voice, Nicole. Apps. Um, I also wanted to share that um, technology companies, if you are uh, trying to do AAC evaluations from an evidence-based standpoint, and you're doing this regularly as part of your clinical practice, please reach out to the technology companies and see if there's anything that they can do for you as a professional. Um, they will often give you a free trial, free 14 days, free version, um, so that you can work with clients before you can get the device in their hands, um, because often there's some barrier um, to access and communication, especially when they're little. Um,
Yes, there are devices that you can borrow for families. Karen, I'm not sure where you're located. I'm in the state of Illinois, um, but most states have a lending library. Um, the lending library, um, the lending library uh, will, in my state at least, you put a request in for whatever technology is available that you're looking for. They have a very extensive library. And so when you're looking at that extensive library, it's free to check it out. It's just a $20, um, what do you call it? A uh, $20 fee to return the device. Um, skin color selection should not be a big deal. Um, the big goal is effective communication. Just my thought. I wouldn't make the client feel uncomfortable when the goal is effective communication. Thanks for sharing that thought. Um, I think as long as you're having the conversation with the family, family's cool with it. We just keep moving along. Um, I'm a school SLP and will be getting devices for autism spectrum disorders. Students who are nonverbal, how do I train the parents on how to use the device? Um, As you guys are typing more questions, it moves my uh, my line of sight down. So I apologize. I'm scrolling up and down here. Um, when you're training the parents on how to use the device, you're going to start with the personally relevant vocabulary, and you can start with that operational framework. And you can do that for a variety of different vocabulary um, vocabulary options. Um, I do have a few different um, vocabulary selection handouts where parents can prioritize what vocabulary is taught in initial therapy planning sessions, and I'm happy to share those with you. Yes, I would be happy to access the resources and handouts that were discussed. Um, when training across settings, how do you train for inputting new vocabulary? Do you said something written that will help them or do you have one session for all across settings? How do you train for inputting new vocabulary? When you say inputting new vocabulary, um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean here, um, but I can provide a few different thoughts unless you wanna um, come on and kind of share a little bit more. I, when I add new vocabulary or am teaching specific vocabulary during a session, I do a written session note for families um, that talks about what was added, why it was added, um, and that is often shared with the, the client's therapy team, especially if I'm transitioning them from speech to um, ABA, for example. Um, and I can give you, I can send an example of what that session note looks like. Um, I have a student who successfully used a specific app uh, for a few years. The parent is now pushing a different app that is not working for the child. What would you do? Um, fantastic question. Um, you're going to be navigating that difficult conversations bucket here, it sounds like, um, shortly. When we look at client success, um, I would encourage you to look at all of the different language areas and how you're defining um, successful AAC use. Um, if successful AAC use is um, requesting, if it's turn-taking, is it semantics, is it pragmatics, is it literacy socialization and seeing what the, the client can do. If the parent is pushing a different application, why are they pushing that application? Um, once you have some of these questions answered, and you can almost put it in, you know, chart format, um, it should help you as the clinician to help navigate this. Um, the family is going to be the one that's with the child for the longest amount of time. So you as the clinician have to respect the family's um, thoughts about not liking that language choice for their child. Um, often we are not going to be the clinicians on the caseload um, for the entirety of that child's life and the parent is. So um, the best um, thing to do in that scenario is being able to provide um, the, res the resources, the research, show what they can do with their current device, show what they need to do to be able to communicate and then talk about what they want to do. You can go back to that operational framework to help have these conversations.
Okay, I love a copy of the language, family language survey, duly noted. Um, I'm glad you thought the presentation was fantastic. Um, yes, I will share email contact information if it hasn't already been shared in the chat. Um, I'd be happy to provide anything, um, any resources that will help you all in your clinical practice. And yes, this webinar will be available at a later time. All right, it looks like you're at the end of that list, but I do have a few that showed up in chat, if you'd be happy to answer oh, those. Sure. Um, there was one earlier. Um, it was, um, you may get the, to this, and, and you might have addressed it already, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Um, can you apply the same trajectory to an individuals with intellectual disabilities? And this is when you were, um, I don't recall exactly which slide you were on at that point. Yes, you can. Um, and when we talk about, you know, language planning tra trajectory, I believe I had shared that your clients may not reach full independent communication across all of those different linguistic areas, but how independent can you get that client, no matter what their um, disability is or ability is. Um, ultimately, that's the goal and that um, dynamic assessment goals grid um, helps you explain that to families in a, in a clear way. All right, next question. What are some resources to support teaching the parents and caregivers how to learn the AAC language? And this is similar to another question you answered, so. Yeah, there are quite a few resources. Um, really, the best way to teach families to use AAC is to use AAC with the families and to show buy-in with how um, you are using it in session. So starting with that personally relevant vocabulary and teaching as much about it as you can. So I use that example of um, swing. So if you're gonna swing, um, is it a swing? I want to swing, where's the swing? Let's go to the swing. Um, and at, if you start small with just one word and all those things about that one word, um, it should be more attainable for the family and yourself. There's also one question about if you would be willing to share the slides. I didn't want to say yes on your behalf, um, but I wanted to present that to you. Um, oh, yeah. We wanted to add a <laughs> list of handouts and things that people have requested. Definitely. I'd be happy to. Jim, is there a list of email addresses for everyone that attended today, or how? It, what's the best way to get in touch with everybody? Yeah, I can pull a list. I can work with you on putting together a message that we can send out to everybody. Oh, fantastic. And I'll make sure everything that everyone asked for is in there. You're welcome. I'm getting a lot of thank you. So thank you all. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to scroll and just check in the chat one more time here. Um, uh, is it possible to teach AAC, AAC skills via virtual platforms? Yes, it does not have to be strictly hands-on. Um, there are um, specific interfacing software that you can use, such as New Voice, to, um, to do that. Um, I'm interested in all the handouts, surveys, apps, and resources. Yep, I'm glad it was informative and helpful. All right. Uh, there's a few people asking about ASHA CEUs here. Um, so, Jim, could you address how that works here? And sure. maybe okay. one more time, and then we can wrap up. Absolutely. Um, so the ASHA CEUs, to earn those for ABLE U, you'll need to complete the short assessment. I've posted that link in the chat a few times. I'll post it again uh, right now. Um, let me make sure I got the right one. Sorry, I think I may have posted the, the incorrect one in the chat a few minutes ago. Okay, so that, that post session link is gonna take you to a page with two links on it. One is for the, the survey and one is for the assessment. The survey is completely optional if you'd like to let us know uh, what you thought about the presentation. The assessment is required if you want ASHA CEUs. If you're here uh, just for the PD hours and you don't need those ASHA CEUs, it's completely up to you whether or not to complete that assessment. All right, and it All looks right. like, oh, sorry, go ahead, Megan. Oh, I was just gonna signal to you, Jim, that I think I I've answered uh, the bulk of all the questions here, and um, I, I think we're, we're wrapping it up here. 
All right, great. Thank you so much for your presentation and your expertise, Megan. Um, for all of you who attended, thank you for attending. I look forward to seeing, or maybe not seeing you, but I look forward to you attending future ABLU sessions. We've got quite a few coming up in the next six months, so be sure to check back on that page. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending, and thank you, Megan. Have a great day. Bye, guys. Thank you.